Kip, it's glad to be back on the Ask Me Anything. I know, uh, obviously, last week I was gone. How how you feeling, man? Are you uh, have you recovered from your PTSD of having to do it by yourself? I'm trying to recover. In fact, I'm just <laughs> happy that someone else is on this mic with me because it's. It, it, I'll be honest, it was a little intimidating it's going intimidating. solo. Yeah, it's intimidating. It's it's really really awkward. But to your credit, man, you did an excellent job, and we got a ton of positive feedback. So I'm actually just thinking about making that a permanent thing. I, I didn't tell you that, yet, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're considering just having you run the AMAs from now on. I wouldn't be surprised if you've some whittled some type of strategy into your grand scheme of order of man. Yeah, a lot of people think what I do is random, and it's not. It's very very calculated down to the T. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's so random. It is like, the one thing I will say that I'm really, really good at. It's it's executing. You know, I, I might not always get it right. Yeah. But I'm very good at execution. The strategy stuff is not necessarily my strength. I'm just like go, go, go. We'll figure it out along the way, and if we mess up, we'll just draw back a little bit, re- regroup, and then get back into it. So the strat. So it's not. It's not some grand, grand design here, guys. It's, we're, we're flying by the seat of our pants. Yeah. You know what's great about that, Ryan, though, is if you focus all your time on strategy, then the strategy has to be right. But if you le- spend yeah. less time on strategy and you just take action and you do what you do is excellence and all that you do, guess what? Things kind of work themselves out. Well, and the other side I think about too is like, what's the greater threat, right? Is the greater threat that you don't plan it well enough or is the greater threat that you never take action on your ideas. Yeah. And overwhelmingly the majority of people, the greater threat in their life is that they just don't take action. I mean, we're not talking about brain surgery here, right? What we're doing here is not life or death. Uh, So if we mess up, you know, we may lose a a few thousand bucks or something or, 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 or kill some time that, that could have been used somewhere else, but they're all learning experiences and nobody's going to die because we mess up. Yeah. Well, and there's, I feel like we've said this so many times, but there's so much learning and just in doing that you wouldn't even know you you would be unaware and you would have not, you would not have the opportunity to even learn from those scenarios without the action, right? That action was required to learn those lessons. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and you can, you can lay this, this perfect plan and strategy in every situation going absolutely correct, right? In this very controlled, isolated environment of your mind. And yet when you start implementing this stuff, you realize, oh, not only did I not plan for that, I didn't even anticipate that that could potentially come up. (laughs) Totally. So you can't plan for everything. You plan the best you can, uh, do what you can, but if it's keeping you from inaction, then the planning and the strategy is becoming a hindrance rather than actually helping you progress towards yeah. whatever path you're, you're wanting to walk. And that's why I love your story about how you got started podcasting. I think that's a perfect example of just taking action and then opportunities and ideas and learning pre- presented themselves and then it evolved into what it is today. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because a lot of people will ask me like, Hey, how did you, how did you build order a man? How have you had so much success over the past four years? And we've done a lot of things right. I mean, let's not discount that. I, yeah. I work my tail off to ensure that what we're doing here is valuable, that we're bringing high quality guests on, that uh, the programs and the services and everything that we're offering to the events and the products, to all of that stuff is top notch. All right. I, I'm not discounting that. But when I see articles from uh, the American Psychological Association dismissing the, not even dismissing, just flat out saying that masculinity is somehow inherently wrong or bad or evil. Um, and then just ad after ad after ad dismissing and downplaying and undermining and mocking and ridiculing masculinity. I can't help but be a little excited about that, knowing that, frankly, we just stepped into a, something that ha- had been of interest of mine. We just stepped into it at the right moment. And the market was completely ready for what it is we're offering. And every day I open up my browser and I have over a dozen emails or Instagram messages from people who are like, Hey, did you see this latest article? Did you see this latest article? And I can't help but be a little excited about it because what we're doing here is the antithesis of that mockery of masculinity. And so I I, I'm excited about it because it's opening this window. Unlike it has been even in the past four years. So you know, we, 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 the, I'm getting to a point here, but we hit the market at a very good time, which happened to be very fortunate because I didn't plan that. Uh, but if I didn't take action, 
that window could have potentially just passed us by and I wouldn't even have been able to, to recognize that it was there. It was that action that allowed me to see, oh, there's something here. So it's not just luck because we've heard that term that, that what it, how does it go? Luck is when preparation, opportunity and preparation meet, right? Yeah. And so there was this huge, huge opportunity in the marketplace for reclaiming and restoring masculinity, which is what we're doing here. And there was my preparation. I had another podcast before I was running another business. And so there was things that were going on a decade before order of man that was actually leading up to an opportunity that presented itself. And then us being able to capitalize on and walk through that door of opportunity. Yeah. And it seems like that market has just gotten bigger of late. Like it's, it, when you started order of man, it was almost perfect because it gave you a little bit of ramp time. It did. It gave me some leg room. Yep. Yeah. We had some leg room, some ramp time to get substantially larger. And then now, now that the floodgates have opened, we're in a position to like do, do good. Yeah. I mean, I, even in just, just in my own little, little mind here, I'm thinking like, Oh, keep, keep the, keep, keep mocking masculinity, keep undermining masculinity, keep coming up with these ridiculous assertions and these, these uh, pseudoscience type uh, studies that you're doing. Keep it coming, keep it coming. Cause the more you do that, the more you create a desire, well, not even a desire, just this, this, this need for the message that we're sharing of masculinity and why we all need to step up as men in the walls of our home and our businesses and communities. And so as this, this vocal minority gets louder, it's actually yeah. really, really exciting to me because it actually lifts up, uh, up us. I can't even say that up as well. I'm trying to say that. I don't know why I can't say that. Yeah, it, <laughs> First I'm saying that. It is causing the conversation to happen. And I, and I think people are seeing those messages and, and they're calling bullshit on it. Yeah, for sure. And it, and it makes them frustrated. And then, and then they are. see the answer, right? Here we are. Yeah. yeah. And that's actually a really good, that's kind of a good segue into, so in February, so what is it right now? This will be, this is the 15th today. This will be released on the 16th. If you're listening to this today, it's released. Uh, in two weeks, we are launching our tribe builder course, which is basically, there's 20 of us in the, in the tribe builder, myself included. I'm very active in the tribe builder, but it's a four week course designed to help you take an idea and a thought to, or maybe you already have one to now, how do we build a tribe and a movement and a growth, uh, an organization, a fraternity, whatever it may look like around this idea, very similar to what we've done here mm -hmm. with order of man. And so everything that we're talking about right now is covered in depth and in detail in the tribe builder course. And I know it's a little different and I've had people say that like, well, this isn't about masculinity. I know it's not, I know it's not about masculinity, but at the same time, it kind of is because we are, we are called, I believe now, whether we step into the calling or not is different, but we are called to lead. We are yeah. called to have a voice. We are called to act. And I've, I have very rarely have I come across a, an individual a man who didn't have an idea right? Or didn't have a vision for the future. Didn't have a message or an experience that he feels that, that can better society. Now, some are better at communicating and articulating that vision and idea than others, but we all have ideas. And the better that we can get at sharing those ideas, the more that we impact our families, our businesses, our communities, our bank account, our, our, our emotional and mental well-being. So, even though, yes, it's not directly tied to masculinity, helping men create tribes and movements around issues that are relevant to them quite literally change the world. Yeah. So that's what the tribe builder is all about. Um, if you're interested, check it out. I think we have like maybe two or three spots left. I'd have to look, but I think we only have two or three spots left. And if you go to order of man.com slash tribe builder, uh, you can watch a very quick video from me, look and see what benefits are in there. Just know that I'm very involved in the process. It isn't something you sign up for and then I'm done. I'm gone. No, I'm, I'm yeah. very involved in the process. Um, when does that start again? February 1st, 2019. February 1st. Yeah. Yeah. And don't, don't message me and say, Hey, when are you doing another one? I don't know. Again, it's very sporadic. It's like, I kind of feel like doing it right now. So I'm going to do it right now. And maybe I do another one later in the year. Maybe I don't feel like it, or maybe something else comes up. So if you're even remotely interested, invest in yourself. Let's take four weeks. I'll Let's teach you everything I know. I'll pull back the curtain. I'll critique, um, I'll help, I'll, there's 80 other guys from previous courses that have gone through it and we're all in this stuff together. We're going to help you build whatever it is you're, you're trying to build. So order slash tribe builder. 
Copy. All right. Well, enough of that. Let's get into the should conversation. We, should we tell them what the AMA is? <laughs> yeah, because we're not. Yeah, we, we do this every week. I don't know why we do this. We ought to lead with that. So the AMA, Ask Me Anything, you're going to hear from Kip Sorensen and, and myself. Uh, we are answering questions from uh, Patreon. And if you're interested in that, it's uh, Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash order of man. Uh, there's some benefits and perks. In fact, uh, one of the little giveaways we're doing right now, I'm just trying to pull this up because I've got this on my desk. Bear with me here. Is I'm trying not to bump my mic because that gets obnoxious. But anyways, Ooh. dichotomy of leadership. So uh, this is Jocko Willink and Leif Babin's newest book. Great book on leadership. We're giving this away in, on, on Patreon. With a uh, uh, beard hair uh, bookmark concluded. That's right. Laminated beard hair, beard hair bookmark. I should do that. I should do that for April Fool's. I'm sorry. I have to interrupt, man. I just thought of a great idea. I don't Order. know. I'm not, I'm not no, no, convinced no. it's going to be a great idea. Okay. Order of Man t-shirt. <laughs> Order of Man okay. t-shirt with, with a silhouette of Bubba's face on the front with a curb brim hat and then a tagline underneath that says, because not every man is perfect. <laughs> I like that. I think Bubba would appreciate. It. I thought you were going to go to his uh, his banana hammock comment. No, no, I was staying away. I was staying away from that entirely. <laughs> All right, there it is, guys. If you're interested in that, um, let us know. And if we have enough guys who are interested, then we'll put it out into the world, and Bubba will be pissed. Which actually is the reason it makes it so great. All right. So Patreon. Uh, what else? Sorry. Iron Council. That's our exclusive brotherhood. Five hundred plus members all working together, working through our battle plans. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, it's really, really incredible what, uh, what we've been able to do in the Iron Council. Kip, you're a team leader and my, uh, and my right-hand man is the uh, – we've got to come up with some fancy term, but like team leader. 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 Team leader, <laughs> leader. Assistant to the leader, team leader. I don't know, whatever. We've we got to come up with something, but uh, – uh, that's like an office reference. It right? is. It's like uh, the assistant, assistant to, to the man to the regional yeah. manager versus yeah. the assistant manager. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, so we've got the. Uh, get into it. I think. Did I lose you? No, we're good. Okay. Yeah. You just froze for a second. Froze. All right. So let's, uh, let's get into this. Let's, uh, let's have the conversation. Let's start uh, hashing these questions out. All right. Cool. First question. So we have uh, a handful of questions from the Patreon members. Uh, Chris Dunez. First of all, I want to thank you guys for what you do. Order Man has definitely helped me uh, be bolder and more decisive and to own every action in the few months that I've been following. I've been having money troubles, and I already have a plan and timeline that we'll be working towards, but some months are still hard to get by. My question is, when, it is, when is it okay to ask for help? I was raised to be very proud, and it's hard for me to admit when I, uh, when I can't make ends meet and when I need help from my amazing family. It's a good question. So, in fact, I really appreciate that question because I think too many people are so quick to, to ask for a handout, yeah. right? Uh, I would say that in order of priority, you ought to look at more of a hand up than necessarily a handout. So, what I would suggest is, let's say you're going to ask your family for, for some money to cover the mortgage. I don't know if that's it, but we'll just use that as an example. Rather than asking for money, why not, why not go to your family and say, hey, you know what? I've got a plan. I'm kind of struggling to make ends meet right here. Be truthful about it. I'm struggling to make ends meet right now. I've got a plan. Here's my plan. In the meantime, you know, can I, can I do some yard work around your house this weekend? You know, I, I, I know you've got, you've got to do some gravel and you want to put some sod down or you want to do this or that. Can I, can I come out? Can you hire me to come do that for you? I think that speaks significantly higher of you than just saying, hey, can you help me cover the mortgage this month? And not yeah. to say there isn't a point where maybe you'd ask that, but if you can look for a hand up rather than a hand out, I think that's the progression of the way that you should use it, right? So maybe there's some odds and ends. Uh, maybe there's some things that you can sell around the house. Maybe there's some people who are, are looking for some labor and you can do that. Like there's all kinds of little opportunities to be, hand, to, to be helped up rather than just giving you charity. And there's nothing wrong with charity. I try to be charitable and I encourage other men to be charitable, but I'm cautious to accept charity 
especially if I know I'm fully capable of earning that. So I would say try to find, I don't want to say balance, but find the connection between somebody offering some help and then you being able to add some sort of value to that individual in return. Hmm. Ryan, do you think that when we take handouts, it, um, that we could be a victim of that a little bit, like get in a place of, you know, oh man, that was easy. And oh, I'll just ask for help again. Like there's a little bit of a slippery slope there sometimes when we ask for handouts. I think a lot of people feel ashamed and guilty of asking for handouts. And frankly, you should. Yeah. You should. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't accept a handout if that's what's needed. But if you feel bad about accepting a handout, that to me is the correct emotion. Yeah. Because if you don't feel bad about that, what kind of loser are you? (laughs) Yeah. Like, I don't know how else to sugarcoat that. When, when I, I look, I've had help. All right. My mom's helped me out in the past. Fortunately, we're in the position financially where that's just not necessary right now. Could that be in the future? Sure. Never know. Absolutely. Yeah. It could, but I've built a lot of relationships up and I have a lot of relationship capital that, that there are a lot of people who would be willing to help out if, if need be. But if I don't feel bad about that, I'm kind of a scumbag, quite honestly, like I'm yeah. a mooch. And, and I know that might sound really harsh because there are people who are incapable of paving their own way and providing their own, their own resources. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is a man who's potentially down on his luck a little bit. He's beat up or the economy or whatever else it is, but he knows that he's fully capable mentally, physically, emotionally of providing and carving his own path. And yet he isn't doing it for whatever reason ends aren't coming together. You should feel bad. That, that, that feeling of guilt or, or inadequacy is actually a positive thing because hopefully what it does is drives you not to be in that position anymore. Yeah. Like we live in this society that's so sensitive. It's like, Oh, we don't want anybody to feel bad. No, I want you to feel bad. I think about my son's sports teams, for example, is when they lose, I want them to feel bad about losing. Yeah. I don't want them to be excited. Hey guys, we did our best. No guys. Look last week we got throttled, man. I think the score was like 45 to 12 or 15 or something. This team absolutely destroyed us. And I encouraged them in the game. I said, guys, we're down. We're not going to win this game. We're not going to win this game. But right now you have an opportunity to show me what kind of heart you have. Do you give up because we're not going to win? Or do you continue to drive and drive and earn some of that respect back that maybe we lost in the first three quarters? And I know that you're feeling down and you're feeling bad about it. And that's the right emotion, boys. You should feel bad about it. Because we, we are here to win. We're here to learn the game. We're here to excel. We're here to improve ourselves. And we're here to dominate. And when we're not doing that, you should feel bad. And what that does is that drives us then to come back next week and figure out where we messed up and how we can improve. And I think there's way too many people out there who are like, oh, it's okay, guys. You had, you had fun. And you tried your hardest. And that's <laughs> really what counts. No, it isn't. There, when, when you become an adult, there's no metric in life that says, hey, Kip, how much fun are you having? You can go ahead and pay me in fun tickets this, this <laughs> month on your, your mortgage bill. No. Yeah. In real life, what we look at is we look at performance. And so when you feel bad because you're underperforming, good. You should feel bad. What are you going to do about it? And it's my job as a man and their coach to help bridge the gap between feeling bad about a loss and how we use it as fuel to improve moving forward. I'm getting on a soapbox here. But the point is, feel bad about needing a handout. Accept that you need it. Feel bad about it. You already came up with a plan. Try to offer some sort of value in exchange for the value you're receiving. And and I think that's the better approach. Yeah. It's the Goggins month, man. It is, man. Goggins Goggins. is next week. Uh, Let's see. Actually, as of this recording, I'm going to be interviewing him tomorrow. So that'll be out next week. I'm excited about that. I, I've heard his name reference as David effing Goggins, right? Okay. Yeah. I've heard, I don't know where I heard that, but like someone, whenever they talk about him, they always say David effing Goggins <laughs> and uh, effing. That's my Utah version of the other. Yes. One, you know I mean? Freaking. Uh, freaking. Yes. And um, I get it now. Like, in fact, now what I think of him, I think. David effing Goggins. He's insane, man. Dude, the guy is awesome. 
So, I'm into, I'm a little intimidated to be honest. I mean, it'll be fine, you know, but I'm intimidated yeah. to be able to sit down with a guy like that. Did yeah. you, uh, did you hear my interview with TJ Dillashaw yet? No, it didn't yeah. come out yesterday, right? As of the release of this podcast. So it came out today as a today. recording, but I haven't listened to it yet. Yeah. It's awesome, man. Oh man. It's awesome. You- Lucky bastard. No luck, no, man. Dude, no dude, luck. That's true. Preparation that's true. and opportunity. People say, how'd you get this? I asked him. You're so lucky. I just sent him a message on Instagram and I said, hey, man, I know you're doing this course. I know what you're, I know you got a fight coming up. Like, I want to promote you. I want to help you. Here's what I'm doing. Here's, here's how this is going to benefit you. Here's the reach, blah, blah, blah. Right. And he's like, he's like, yeah, man. He actually messaged me directly. He's like, yeah, man, I really appreciate that. I'd love to talk with you about it after the fight. And I said, oh, look, I get it. Cause it was like two weeks before the fight. Yeah. And I said, yeah, this weekend, this weekend. Yeah. Saturday. And, uh, and I said, no, I get it, man. That's fine. Hopefully we can make something work. And then I was on my hunt in Arizona and he sent me a message on Instagram. He's like, Hey dude, if you want to do it, like I can make it work. I got, I've got this window tomorrow morning. And I was on a hunt in Arizona in the middle of nowhere, a little small town. And, uh, and I said, all right, let's do it. And then I got off the, off Instagram and message when he confirmed and I was like, crap how are we going to make this work? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I drove to a little, <clears throat> the middle of the day, I drove to a little diner where we were, got some internet. I think the, I think the waitress there was frustrated with me, but we got it done and it is what it is. And it was a cool conversation with an incredible, an incredible man. I mean, somebody who's at the, the top of his game is just doing incredible things. So it was, it was powerful, yeah. man. Kill a shot, man. Kill a shot. <laughs> His, his style with, once he started being coach with uh, Dwayne Ludwig, yeah. his style of stand-up is amazing. Yeah. He his actually talked about his, his coach. angles are oh, just, yeah. oh man. He actually talked about that because awesome. he was working with what, Team Alpha, Alpha Male? Yeah, Alpha, Alpha Male. Yeah, yeah, California. And so he, I talked to him about loyalty because that's the grief he got when he left yeah. Alpha Male and he had, he had that falling out with Garbrandt and everything. And so I talked to him about it. He's like, yeah, dude, people always want to talk about loyalty. He's like, but I was loyal. He's like, I went with my coach, man. I've built a relationship yeah. up with that guy. Um, he's my family. Like he's not my coach. He's family. And we travel the, he says, we travel the world together. And um, he's taught me so much about my game. And he was talking about how, how when he was with alpha male he's like dude we were just like we were just wild he's like we were fighters but we weren't winning any belts and it wasn't until he came on board that we actually started winning and we were, were training in a sustainable way and we started winning belts and champions and championships and it was pretty cool how he talked about loyalty and how he talked about his coach and the, the yeah. admiration and level of respect he had for him too yeah so L- ludwig left alpha male and and right Keith went with him that's right yep, yeah that's right yeah yeah, so Very pretty cool, cool man. I knew you'd appreciate that one. So yeah, man, I'm excited for that fight this weekend. So yeah, cool. All right, question, <laughs> question one down. <laughs> <laughs> what are we into this thing? 25, 30 minutes now. What else? All right, Chris Dalton. Uh, what's your process for creating, editing, and releasing podcasts? I'll be starting one soon on horse human interactions and the impact. Yeah, I, and the impact that relationship has on healing and trauma interested in knowing the mechanics of podcasting that you have found useful look i'm not going to get into this question um not that i want to discount your question because it is a solid question here's what i would do anybody who's wanting to start a podcast just google this pat flynn's guide to podcasting all right i don't need to answer this question because that is the exact guide that i used it's free he's got a free version he's not pulling any punches in the free version either but it's it's all right there step one step two step three step four it's all right there so Pat Flynn's guide to podcasting. I think he made it into a course now, like a paid course. I haven't looked into that. So I would just say use the free version because that's what I've used to build this incredible podcast. We're, we're closing in on 10 million downloads, Kip. Ten, think about 10 million listens. That's incredible to me. That's uh, awesome. So Pat Flynn's guide to podcasting. And then I would also suggest that if you're wondering what equipment Kip and I use, uh, I've got a, a stationary like home recording setup and then i've got a backpack behind me here with my travel pack because sometimes i'll travel and like i'm going down to vegas to meet with goggins for example if you go to orderofman.com slash podcast gear it's just a pdf and it'll show you with links so you can go right to where you need to with my stationary gear and then my traveling gear so pat flynn's guide to podcasting and then orderofman.com slash podcast gear i think is what it is 
There what else? Go. That was easy. Charlie, best practices for transitioning from one battle plan to another, like from 2018 quarter four to 2019 quarter one. So for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, we do quarterly battle planning, 12-week battle plans. Uh, in fact, I've got the battle planner that we use that we've made available. This is what I've used. And I know a lot of guys are using this and we offer these, but I'm actually in the process today. I'll finish of revamp, revamping this. So it'll be the same size, um, leather bound journal, but inside will be a 12 week battle planners to be, to be able to track your 12 weeks. But what I would say is you got to do your after action review to, yeah. to transition. It's about the after action review, right? You've got to look at it and say, okay, what did I accomplish? Did I accomplish what I set out to accomplish? If the answer is yes, Okay, good. Now you can talk about, well, where do I double down? Right now, now I've achieved X, Y, Z. Uh, let's just take weight loss, for example, because that's one of my goals is I want to lose not even weight necessarily, but body fat percentage. So over the past three weeks, I've lost just under 3% body fat. So I feel like I'm on the right track. Um, so as I get to where I want to get uh, come, come the end of this first quarter, then I'm going to evaluate that and say, okay, I hit my target and I know I'll hit my target. So I hit this target. Now what is it about body fat percentage? No, probably not at that point. Now it's about getting that marathon under my belt because I've lost 15 pounds of body fat or whatever it may be. And so the marathon is going to be that much easier. Like it's getting me closer to something else. And this is why vision is so important. So we do our after action review. What did I accomplish? What didn't I accomplish? Uh, what skill sets or techniques or strategies did I do well with? What did I not do so well with? And then you answer that fifth, fifth question, which is, what am I going to do moving forward? That is the transitionary question. I accomplished this. I didn't accomplish this. What am I going to do moving forward? Do I need to continue down the path? Uh, for me, it was deadlifting for a long time. Like I couldn't hit 400 pounds. Now I have, I have now, but I, I was like stuck there. So I had to evaluate, okay, am I doing the right type of training? Am I, am I doing strength training? Am I doing this? Am I doing that? Where am I falling short? And then I just tweaked my battle plan moving forward so that I could actually hit that benchmark. So it's, it's the after action review. That, that's how you transition doing the after action review and very few people actually do it. That's why you and I talk about it so much. Yeah. Nobody does it. Totally. Well, and I think there might be a time in a season sometimes as well. Like when you start a Q4, maybe the top priority was X, Y, Z and come January, things have changed, right? Our, our lives evolve. There's things outside of our control. And so you may need to pivot and go, Hey, I was focused on deadlifts, but now I, this is uh, something came up and this is a more pressing issue, right? Yeah. So. Well, yeah. I mean, we were going to do, so we've got our legacy event. It's a father son event coming up April 11th and the fourth through the 14th. Uh, and I was going to do an uprising event, one for just men, but I actually, at the end of last quarter, nixed that completely that, that men's only event uh, because we are in the process of potentially buying a new property. And so I knew with everything else that I had going on and getting the property, which is where I plan on running events that I couldn't do both. And so I nixed it because now the priority is the property. Once we get that squared away and taken care of, then we can come back to looking at that. So you've got to be able to evolve and adapt along the way. If your plan is so rigid that it doesn't allow for flexibility, you are going to miss opportunities. Well, not to mention your sanity as well. I mean, you're going to go yeah. crazy because you're beating your damn head against the wall against something that frankly may not even be a priority or relevant to you anymore. And so yeah. some guys will say, well, I can't change my battle plan. Well, then you're, you're an idiot, right? The enemy will, will destroy you because you aren't flexible in taking new input and stimulus into consideration to make adjustments yeah. along the way. Totally, totally. Well, and that's why we have those checkpoints, right? As part of the exactly. battle plan where you're, you're evaluating is what I'm doing effective? Is it working? If it's not, we pivot, we adjust. Right. So then that way you can get the results that you're right. Making. And you, and you don't even have to wait until the 12th week to adjust. If you need to adjust three weeks into it, make the adjustment course yeah. correct and, and get it figured out and get back on track or, or change courses, whatever it, whatever it is for you. Yeah. Copy. So Charlie had two questions. A second one for Kip, you mentioned that you lived in Dubai in the past. Any word of advice for an expat who recently moved there? Um, no, I, I mean, I didn't live there for an extended period of time. So I, I don't know if I'd have much advice. I, I mostly just stayed in hotels during the whole time. Um, religion's a little weird there. Uh, you got to keep that on the down low, uh, believe it or not. So um, that's a little odd. I, I don't know if you're there with family. Um, I considered moving there permanently. 
uh, for a period of time. And really the things that kind of drove me not to is one, I, I don't, I wouldn't feel comfortable, uh, my wife being by herself most of the time. And if she needed to go to the store by herself and whatnot. And I just hated the idea that, uh, you know, if I went to, wanted to go to church, I was going to church in some apartment with no markings on the table because it was illegal to do so. I mean, that really? seems, wow. yeah, yeah. So there's no like an official chapels, right? You'd have to meet in someone's house and you couldn't like publicly like, advertise or right. or anything like that. So interesting. Yeah. There's a, there's a huge, I don't know about you guys. I mean, I'd be interested in someone's opinion on this, but I feel like there's this huge unspoken undertone of suppression in Dubai. And it's very odd, very odd. Hmm. Um, and we can get into some other things I've learned uh, l- later in years about Dubai, but it's interesting. Interesting. Nonetheless. Hmm. Sorry, Charlie, that's not much help. All right, so we're <laughs> jumping right into Iron Council questions. Uh, first off, we got Moose. Uh, every time you bring up the idea of masculinity is under attack, there's a lot of pushback on the Facebook slash Instagram page- pages that this is somehow a victim mentality. Can you talk about how to tackle this from a place of sovereignty? Yeah, some, <clears throat> somebody mentioned this the other day because I had posted, I don't know, a video of of – I, I can't even remember a video, of some dismissal of masculinity, something, something I get, like I said, I get a lot of them and somebody's like, Oh, well, I guess it's 2019. So you can just be a victim. I'm like, look, <laughs> if you disagree with something that doesn't make you a victim, what the a victim mentality is helplessness, right? Yeah. Victims are helpless by their very definition. They were unable to help themselves in a situation, whether that's a physical altercation yeah. or, you know, we were talking about handouts earlier they are incapable of helping themselves. So somebody that recognizes some sort of injustice or some sort of wrongdoing in the world is only a victim as if they use it as an excuse to be helpless. But if somebody recognizes something wrong, like I have here with Order of Man and recognizing that we do need to reclaim and restore masculinity, I recognize that there's a dismissal at a minimum and on the far side, an attack on what it means to be a man I haven't put myself in the victim category because I'm dealing in, I don't want to say objective reality because it is subjective. It's, it's, it is an opinion. So I, I don't want to go so bold as to say it's objective. It's not, it's my opinion. This is what I see. Okay. Yeah. But I, I remove myself from the victim category because I do something about it. And, in, 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 and what I see in the world has empowered me to take a new course of action for myself and in the meantime, inspire other people to do the same. It's the same. Th- and I look, I look at women. I mean, you talk about your wife, for example, not, not feeling totally secure that she can go to the grocery store by herself. You know, there's a, a greater threat potentially there, right? So how does she remove herself from the victim category? I think we talked about this a week or two ago when we said, you learn martial arts. Yeah. Now you take what potentially could be a very real threat and you, and you, and you lessen, I'm not going to say you completely diminish, but you lessen that threat because you remove yourself from the victim category and you put yourself in a new category, which says that I am now a martial artist, or I am now capable of defending myself, or I can now be a little bit more situationally aware. So these situations don't actually come up or happen to me. That's how we move from victim to something else entirely. So it's, there's a lot of things that get tossed around, like, especially in the, this like masculine, quote unquote, masculine space, like, like you're a beta, you're a cuck. Uh, what's the other soy boy. Like anytime I hear people say things like the, this, I'm like, this is somebody who's not really intelligently thinking about the, the, the scenario, the circumstance, the, the actual conversation, you know, the, we're, we're not, vi- we're not acting as victims. We're, we're, we're doing something different here to empower us as men to be the type of men that we're fully capable of being. So yeah, if you're helpless, you're a victim. I don't consider myself helpless. I don't think a lot of people who listen to this consider themselves helpless, but anytime somebody either a considers themselves helpless or acts in a way that's helpless, like, well, there's nothing I can do. It's out of my hands. That is a victim mentality. That is not what we're talking about here when it comes to a disagreement or some sort of wrong we see in the world here. Yeah. I mean, the perception that I have whenever I hear victim mentality is, is they're really not even truly victims. They just 
it's just a perception that they have that they're victims. But in most cases, when I, I, I even use that term, when I think of like, I'll stop acting like a victim. I'm not really saying like they are a victim. What I'm saying is you're not a victim. There's plenty of things that you could do to take control of the circumstance, but you're not. Yeah, right. you're taking the easy route out. I mean, it's it's rare that there's actual victims. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, it's true. I, I again, I think it just comes down to the helplessness factor. Like you are physically helpless. Yeah, that's a victim for sure. And hmm. most of us just aren't in that category. Even yeah. though we we a lot of times we like to place ourselves in that category because it's yeah. easier. It's easier to be a victim. Oh, the reason I didn't get ahead is because my boss was an asshole. And the reason that I don't have any money in the bank account is because the economy. And the reason that my marriage is in shambles is because my wife is a bitch. And the reason blah, 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 blah. All excuses to excuse away your own inadequacies. And and you know what? Here's the hardest part. Some of that actually might be true. Like your your wife might need to to work on some things. Your boss may truly be an a-hole. The economy may actually be in in shambles. It's not now, but but it might be. So that's, that's the trap is that there's a lot of reality. There's a lot of truth to that. And because there's truth to it, we, we just rely so heavily on it. But he, here's what I thought, especially as I was early in my financial planning career, I got into the financial planning business when I was in 2008, 2009. <laughs> so like the worst time you possibly get into financial planning, that's when I got into financial planning. And I looked around and I saw a lot of guys who weren't performing and guess what they were saying? Oh, it's because of the economy. Oh, the economy's bad. Oh, this. Oh, that. Oh, the market's lost 30%. And so I started to pick up some of that language. Oh, the reason I'm struggling in my financial planning practice as a new uh, advisor is because the economy's bad and this is happening and that's happening and I can't do anything about it. But I noticed, and I've talked about this before, that there was two guys in my office who were perpetually performing. Week in and week out, month in and month out, year after year, always at the top, even in a quote unquote bad economy. And I thought to myself, if the economy is really that bad, then shouldn't everybody be struggling? Like if it it is genuinely the economy that's keeping me from succeeding, then it would be, then everybody would be struggling. And yet here I found these two individuals who were thriving in what everybody else was saying was a horrible economy. So there's something else going on here. What is it? And, and, and long story short, I sat down with these guys and I eventually partnered up with them and they taught me what they knew about how to run a financial planning practice and how to manage money and how to ask for referrals. And they didn't turn themselves into the victim. In fact, they realized that these are opportunities to capitalize because everybody's bitching and moaning and complaining and wandering around like with their heads up their asses because they think that it's out of their hands. And yet these two guys are running around scooping up clients left and right because everybody else had thrown up their hands and given up. These are, these are individuals who could have taken the victim mentality and yet they didn't. They said, oh no, I'm not a victim. Here's the circumstance. Now what can I do about it? Yeah, that's great. Gatchko, Christopher Gas- Gatchko. I'd love to hear about the book. What was your after action review on it? How many copies did you end up selling? Anything you realized after the fact that you missed and would have liked to included ideas for the next book or books? Okay, so yeah. Um, I, you know, it's a good question. I need to look and see how many books we've sold. It's tens of thousands. I don't know exactly where it is. So I'll find that out. Um, as far as the after action review, I felt like I did a really, really good job in getting the book out there. I felt like our marketing. From a timeline perspective. Timeline. Yeah. I mean, I wrote the book in 90 days. Yeah. Yeah. I'd been thinking about writing it for years and I'm like, Oh, I'm just going to keep putting it on. And I kept, kept kicking the can down the road. <laughs> I got time. I got time. I got, time. I'm like, man, I woke up and I just, I realized I'm like, if I'm ever going to write a book, like I need to just, I need to write and I need to do it in the next 90 days. In fact, that was one of my 12 week battle plan objectives. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. So many words per day. A thousand and words just, minimum yep. mm-hmm, every day. And yeah, I missed some days, but I made up for them. And so I hit yeah. that deadline and I felt like I did that really, really well. Um, next book I write will be spread out. It'll still be on a schedule, but it'll be spread out so I can give myself some breathing room because that was a really, really stressful time for me. Um, trying to balance that and the family and the business and everything else that we were doing. It's tough. It's really tough. So I felt like we did that good. Um, marketing was okay. The, the, the way that it looks and the formatting was awesome. I, I hired a great designer. I had a great editing team. Like we had a lot of good pieces in the puzzle. 
Um, you know, there were some things with the publisher that, that I think there was some miscommunication between them and I that, that, uh, how do I, I don't want to say bitter, but just like a little bit of like frustration between both of us, I think, but I didn't know. And I wish I would have known that stuff and had a better sense of expectations, but because I didn't know that, uh, and, and part of that was because the timeline I was on, uh, that was tough for them and tough for me. So, so that was a challenge. I think I would work on that relationship and the expectations of the publishing process a little bit better. Um, yeah, I've got, I've got some ideas for some new books. I've thought about um, not a kid's book, but talking more about raising boys. That's become really, really relevant and important to me. Um, I've also ta- thought about breaking down the three components of masculinity, protect, provide, preside a little bit more mm-hmm. in depth and like really going into detail, uh, but, look, but b- being a lot more uh, factual and looking at the research and, and the history behind what it has traditionally and generally meant to be a man yeah. using studies and resources and scientific based uh, studies and findings to prove that this is generally what the majority of societies have considered quote unquote manly and then why it's so important we step into those roles and what the, what the result of not stepping into those roles is and how we more adequately fulfill our responsibilities. So I've got a lot of stuff, I've got a lot of stuff on my mind about a book. And I imagine towards the second half of this year, we'll, we'll begin that process. Anything in the current book that you feel you wish you would have included? Uh, no, no. I, I feel like I did a that. really good job on the book. I, well, okay, let me back up. I think the thing I would have included is I would have, I wrote it from a position of more anecdotal evidence, like my own life. Yeah. Incorporating those research and those, those findings and the more historical accounts, I think I could have merged more of that in to give it a stronger foundation than it had rather than just personal anecdotal evidence. Yeah. That's Understood. probably what I would have added. Although that's, that, that's the time consuming part, right? That, it is the time consuming part. And frankly, it's the part that I'm not great at. You know, I've yeah. always been somebody who's like, people ask me about my faith a lot. They're like, well, how do you know? Like you believe in God. How do you know? Or how do you know that the church you belong to is the right church? And my answer has always been the same. It's that I just feel like that's the right thing. (laughs) I wish I could explain it more in depth than that. I wish I had some great in-depth dissertation or analysis for you to ponder. I don't, I just, I've always been, I've always trusted my gut. Mm -hmm. And I know when my gut says do this, that I should do that. Yeah. Um, and I know that when it says, don't do this, then I shouldn't do that. And every time I've gone against my gut instinct, I've, I've failed. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's, there's real power in, in just listening to what either your gut or my belief is divine inspiration is telling you, right? I'm guided. I feel guided. Yeah. And so when I listen to that calling, it serves me very, very well. So it's never really put me in a position where I have to, I feel like I have to like validate my opinion. It is, and I realize it's an opinion. I'm not saying it's factual. I just realize that I believe, I believe so with so much conviction that it's hard for me to understand why anybody else would think differently. Last night I was, um, was it last? It was the night before last and we're, we're reading scriptures and it said something about, man, I can't remember the question, but I had, had a question at the end of the book around, you know, how is, how is, how is the teachings of, of Jesus unique? You know what I mean? Compared to other things like school or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, totally got on a soapbox. My family, man, sometimes they're like, Oh dad. Oh no. They they could tell like, okay, he's preaching. Um, but one of the things I said to my kids is guys, um, spirituality and religion, they don't work that way. There, there is no, there is no like, oh, let me, let me grab a book that was written hundreds of years ago. Read all the evidence. Oh, okay. Oh, yep. Mm-hmm. Done. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Like it requires what? 
it, what you were talking about earlier, action. Mm-hmm. There's, that's the only way that you are actually learning anything spiritually. Now, and we can apply this to other aspects of life, but that's how it works is you do, you see the fruit of your labor and you go, yep, that's good for me. Right. right? But it requires action and faith. There is no logical like, oh, let me, let me think through this. Oh, yep. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. This is the right church for me. Right. It's like, no, it doesn't work that way. And it's hard because, well, yeah. And I think a lot of people will say, well, that's an easy cop out. It's not a cop out. It's a lot of work. What do you mean a cop it's, out? It's just, a, <laughs> well, not only that, it's just a different metric. Yeah. Right. Like we all have tools in our tool belt and we all have ways of measuring whatever from, you know, how much uh, bandwidth we have on the internet to how long our beard is to whatever. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. we, we have all these different metrics. Uh, how many words are in a book? Like these are just metrics. And to say that a feeling isn't a metric, isn't some sort of tool that you can tap into and harness, I, I think is missing part of it. Like not everything has to be proven scientifically for it to exist. There's things that exist that, well, well, what is it? Dark matter, right? Or, or dark energy. Like we know it's out there. Scientifically, we know there's a force acting upon molecules and, and the things that we interact with. And yet we don't understand it. We don't know what it, we know it's there. We, we see scientifically the evidence of it and yet we can't explain it. Yeah. Well, what's going on there? There's a phenomenon that we just can't fully articulate, but it is present and it doesn't discredit the fact that it's there. It just means that it's hard to articulate. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Cool. What else? All right. Billy Hattridge, how important is prayer to you and your family? It is incorporated into a set routine or more spur of the moment. Both, both. I mean, we do. So I go out, I work out in the morning at six. So I'm up about five 30, uh, getting stretched out, you know, hydrating, things like that. And then I go into the gym, work out for an hour. I come back at seven. And the first thing we do is uh, family scripture study. So we read the scriptures and people ask me like, Oh, what's your devotional? It's, we don't, I don't know. We don't do a devotion. We just read the scriptures. And then we talk about what it meant. That's her devotional. Uh, and then, so there's, there's six of us in the family. So these are weekdays. So there's six of us in the family, five of us who are capable of, of giving a prayer. Right. <laughs> yeah. So Monday's me, Tuesday's my wife, uh, Wednesday's my oldest son, Thursday's my second son. And then Friday's my, my little girl. And so we just take turns and we do a, a morning prayer and we talk about what we're thankful for. And we talk about, um, you know, we, we, we ask for guidance and direction and we ask for an open heart and an open mind to be able to serve and learn and do the things that, that he would have us do. Uh, and then throughout the day, you know, anytime, for example, I'm, I'm driving down to Vegas, which is an hour and a half drive from, from here to Vegas, not very far, but we'll, we'll say a family prayer that basically is that dad will be protected as he's driving down there. He'll get down there safely. He'll have, uh, God's inspiration, um, and, and guidance and direction as he's doing his work that's meaningful and significant and that the family will stay safe as dad's away. Uh, and then if, you know, I get myself into a situation where maybe I feel uncomfortable or I need some guidance or help, like that's spur of the moment, I'll pray and, and ask for guidance and ask for direction and ask for some clarity and focus. And, and even more so than that, I think this is really important about prayer that I think a lot of people get wrong. I think people just ask for stuff, right? Like, oh, I just need this. Like, I, I really need this. <laughs> or, or can you give me an answer? Like, what, what should I do? What should I do? Well, it doesn't work like that. I, I think the way that it works is that God's given you all the tools and gifts and the abilities and the talents and the ability to discern and come up with your own solutions. So I very rarely just say, what should I do? I, I go through the process. You know, we're, we're considering a move to Maine. And I know a lot of people say, well, should I move or shouldn't I move? I believe we should. And I'm doing everything I possibly can. And then, I, and then in earnest prayer, I, I ask, am I doing the right thing? Here's what I've done. Here's why I feel like this is the path that we are meant to go. And here's why I think this is going to be a good thing for us. Am I making the right decision? Are there things that I haven't yet considered that I ought to consider in our planning? And it's, it's those moments of clarity that, that unlock something that maybe I didn't have before, right? Some, some, some information or some perspective that I hadn't considered because I had done the work first. Yeah. And a lot of people say, oh, just pray, 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 pray. Well, you got to do the work. Yeah. You got to do your part, right? A lot of, uh, one of the things I talk about quite a bit is, is people say, well, if it's God's will.
will. You know, if, 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 if they want to do it, they can make it happen. They're sitting here waiting for me and here God is sitting waiting for us. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I just wish more people would, act. I'm not saying don't rely so heavily on, on, on God. I'm just saying, understand that you, he's already given you the tools. Use them. Use them. Yeah. When we talk about this all the time, you know, where, where's learning located? You know, sometimes it's, it's, the learning is in the process of making the mistake and making the bad decision and the stress yeah. of, yeah. is this the right thing? I mean, it, those are all great opportunities to learn in advance. I mean, it, it's folly for us to think that those are, we can uh, evolve and become better without those experiences. That's true. Like so many of us are praying for an easy life. Right? Yeah. Which like, is, I don't want an easy life. Well, yeah, yeah. Which you might as well just pray and say, please don't let me progress and become a better person. That's really <laughs> That's <what you're> true. <laughs> Synonymous with, yeah, no, it's totally true. You know, it is. It is. And, and a lot of people, the word I don't like, I don't like this word, happy. And authentic. Yes. So and yeah, genuine too. and all those things. <laughs> well, let me say, by the way, with authentic, because you mentioned this in the podcast the other day, <laughs> it's not that I don't appreciate the meaning of the word. <laughs> okay. All right. It's not that I don't appreciate the meaning of the word. I just don't like the word itself because it's marketers have got a hold of it. Yeah. And because good. marketers have got a hold of it by their very definition. And, and look, I'm a marketer. I mean, let's be real. Yeah. By, by the very definition of a marketer, they're not authentic. Yeah. yeah by, by their very definition. <laughs> yeah. So anytime a marketer gets a word of a hold of a word like integrity and authentic and genuine. You just got to be real. You got to be the real. It's like, you just, you're not you being just, real with me right now. Yeah. Right. You just like completely changed the, the meaning and the significance of that word. So it's not that I don't believe in the meaning. It's that I don't appreciate the word itself. I used it first. So yeah. So you're safe. What was I saying, man? What was I talking uh, about? You, you're happy. You don't like happy. Oh, I don't like happy. It's like, <laughs> I just want to be happy. Why? That's a stupid goal. <laughs> like, why do you want to be happy? I want to be satisfied. I want to yeah. be fulfilled. And what did both of those require? Overcoming something. Yeah. Like doing something. Happy is just like this state of perpetual bliss. That's stupid. Like that'll be, that'll be fun for like an hour. And you're like, okay, well, now what? I'm going to do something now. Yeah. So I, I mean, want to be satisfied because I know I did something that I didn't previously think possible or that I wasn't able to do last week. And now I'm not, ha I'm not happy about it. I'm satisfied. I'm fulfilled. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I've, I've benefited from that. Well, I mean, look at, look at Goggins and say, okay, take Goggins' life and then say, what's, what's assume that he just pursued happiness instead? Yeah. You know, he's just going to be happy. Man. Are you yeah. kidding? His life would look so drastically different. We wouldn't be reading about the guy. No, we wouldn't. Right? We wouldn't even know about him. It's crazy. Cool. What else? Cool. Uh, where are we? Jeff Bennett. I have really started to ramp up my training in preparation of an event, and I'm going to be doing it at the end of April. This is something that is really important to me to do. Although I talked, talked it through with my wife and she was on board. I'm scrolling. I'm starting to get the hint that she may not be on board as much as I thought. My question is, do I follow through with my pursuit knowing it is not a forever thing or do I back off before, she, before her concerns are solidified? Do I sacrifice my goals for her? And yes, her concerns are legitimate. So I do not want to begrudge her for voicing them. This extra training takes me away from the family and this leaves her with no help. I think you need to stop for a second and stop assuming all of these little things that you're coming up with that could potentially be in your mind. Cause what you said is I'm starting to get the feeling. What that says to me is that you don't know. Yeah. You're reading her, right? Look, yeah. look, dude, if you're going to be leaving for months, let's just assume it's months. Okay. If you're leaving for months, she, isn't it nice that she's concerned about that? Like she loves you. She wants you to be around. That's valid, but that doesn't mean that she doesn't think you should pursue it. It just means she's like, oh shit, I've got some things I got to deal with. I got to get some things in order. It, do, it doesn't mean that it's like, I don't want to do this. It just means that, oh man, if, if was it Jeff? If yeah. Jeff, right? If Jeff's Jeff. going to do this, 
then that's going to be scary or that's going to be hard. And I'm taxing on me, right? I'm going to be here to take care of the kids myself. And so she may not even be thinking like, I don't, to stay or she'll have to go or what, like whatever. Based on what I heard, that sounds like a bunch of ups, uh, unsubstantiated stories that you've made up in your mind. Just sit down with her and talk with her and say, "Hun, look, we talked about this. You seem fully on board. Now I'm catching this vibe or this feeling that maybe somehow you're not on board. That's what I'm reading. Maybe you can explain that to me. And then you know. Maybe, yeah. and maybe, maybe she does say, well, yeah, it's, you know, I'm scared or I'm going to miss you or it's going to change things for me. And I got to try to figure out, okay, good. Now you can help each other, but like, don't assume, don't assume, you know, what she's experiencing unless you have a clear communication. trap to fall into and we start assuming that uh that we know what other people are experiencing based on their behavior people are weird including you and including me i mean we're weird we do some really strange things for some really strange reasons and not only can we not understand them it's hard for us to articulate that and for other people to understand our behavior. So we got to be very, very careful on the assumptions here. And what's at stake is that he may not fall through with something that was, he is very passionate about. Right. And then, you know, damn well, what's going to happen if he did demonize my wife. Oh man, I never even achieved that because you were unsupportive. And she's like, what are you talking about? I I wanted you to do it. Yeah, totally. Just demonize her and make her wrong and blame her that why you didn't do it either. Right. right? So th- there's a whole lot, there's a lot of danger in this. Yes. Right? You don't get that communication ironed out. Yeah. hundred percent. Sure. Yeah. What else? Fred, uh, Fred Leg- uh, Legrand, how do you deal with a back bad work manager, play the long game or go on the attack? <laughs> well, you don't go on the attack because <laughs> that's not going to work. <laughs> right. You, you, you don't, I mean, it's kind of like, um, what is, what is the martial art like, like judo, right? You use, you use the opponent's uh, momentum against them, yeah. right? I would even say in jiu-jitsu, this is what we Sure, yeah, yeah, and leverage and everything else. So yeah. going on the attack and going berserk will fail you. I promise yeah. it will fail you. It's, yeah. it's not going to work. If you, if you try to attempt to undermine or undercut or belittle or go over his head, avoid the chain of command, it's not going to work. It's yeah. not going to work. You're going to fail. Cause he's better than you at the game, which is why he's the boss and you're not. Yeah. I'm not notice. I didn't say more qualified. I said, he's better at the game right now than you are. And this is a game and it doesn't have to be underhanded. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that sometimes the corporate environment is a game. Uh, Jocko Willink and Leif Babin have some great stuff. The, the, whole, the entire echelon front team. We've interviewed Jocko a couple of times, Leif a couple of times, uh, Dave Burke, JP Dinell. I mean, we've interviewed all of them. And they all talk about this. You help your boss win. You help him look good. You help him win. You do your job to the best of your ability. You don't worry about getting the credit or getting the promotion. You help your boss succeed. Yep. Because what's going to happen is he's going to get promoted. And who's he going to promote or, or suggest or recommend to fill his spot? The guy who, who undermined him at every turn, who made him look like a fool, and try to get him fired or the guy that actually helped him get a promotion. The guy that led, the guy that gave him credit, the guy that he actually likes. So either the boss is going to get a promotion and or the people above him are going to see, oh, man, Ryan's a player. He's a mover. He's shaking. He's making things happen. He's getting deals done. He's, he's having conversations. He's bringing new business in. And, and they'll see that. It's just a natural principle. They're going to see it. So no, you don't go on the attack. You don't form little mutinies and things like this. You make him look good. If you can't do that because it's an environment that's, that's not safe, <laughs> and, and we have those, right? It's, it's, it's either physically not safe or even you're, you're asked to, to compromise your moral standards. Okay, well, that's, that's a situation where you need to move on. Not attack, just, hey, this is an, this is an environment that I can, I can no longer be part of. And yeah, then you don't. move on. Don't make your boss a better pimp than he is or a better, better drug dealer. Those are the scenarios you leave. 
<laughs> exactly. That's <laughs> just that's, in case. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly right, man. So no, I, I don't think going on the attack is, is a uh, prudent strategy. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Paul Simmered. It's more of a comment and I, and I left it in here. Um, because it, it just helps justify Ryan and I giving crap to Bubba. He oh, says, I thought you were uh, going to say like it was more just a compliment and just justifies us doing what it is we're doing. Yeah, because we're so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, uh, having just joined the IC, I have, uh, I have only ever heard of Bubba on the podcast, primarily on the AMA with Kip. Now I see why you guys bust his balls so much. <laughs> <laughs> So it's your own doing, Bubba. It is, but in all fairness, I mean, Bubba's been with us for years and years and has been instrumental, not only in the movement of Order Man, but instrumental in organizing and bringing some structure and I don't want to say dissenting voice, but always being willing to like show the other side, like, hey, here's something I recognize that, Ryan, you may see, you may not see, right? Here's a blind spot. And so he's always been completely open and forthright about, but never from a position of like undermining or attacking like this last question, it's always yeah. been a position of, hey, I care about you. Uh, I care about the movement. You've helped me, like we've helped him in his life. So he wants to help me. And so he's always willing to say what needs to be said uh, so that, that we can create a better experience for the people we're trying to serve. So yeah, we bust Bubba's balls quite a bit and he deserves it, but he gives it back just as much. <laughs> but the side of it that we don't talk a whole lot about is how instrumental Bubba is in growing this movement and bringing to you guys what it is you have in the Iron Council and just order of man in general. Yeah. And the impact that he's had in guys in the Iron Council. 100%. Level up. Bubba's, Bubba's a stud. Love Absolutely. Him. Even uh, if he is a little off with his hats and banana hammocks. <laughs> like you said, you can't, you can't, be, can't be perfect, right? He's got <laughs> yeah. a lot going for him. He's got a few curb brim hat issues that we need to work on. But other than that, he's solid. Totally. Uh, on that note, Bubba's curious if there's going to be a future uh, curb brim batch since the latest success of the previous batches. Yeah. So th- they did do really, really well to my, well, it was bittersweet, right? It was like a bittersweet day for me. I'm like, man, these hats did really well, but I didn't want them to do as well as they did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there'll be, there'll be more. We've got four. Well, we just got a new shipment in, so they're in, they're in the store now. Yeah. Uh, there's four iterations, four color combinations, but we'll probably do some, some more. His, his request specifically, it sounds like a variation of the scout. So, uh, green, white mesh flex fit. That's actually what he's asking. for. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever do a flex fit. Yeah. I can't envision a day of doing flex fit. I really can't. Could it, could it change in the future? Yeah. But I don't like flex fit hats. I don't think they look good. Um, and the sizing doesn't get right. And then they're too, too tight yeah. in your forehead. I don't, I don't know. I don't like them. All right, Terry Shot. next question. Ryan, if your life was made into a movie, what actor, dead or alive, would you want to play and why? <laughs> oh, dude, I have no idea. I, I really don't. I have no idea. What actor would play me? Um, I don't know. Ryan, uh, you'd want to be um, the – the elf guys in Lord of the Rings, the miners. Who are those guys? Not elves. They're the what? <laughs> the what el- the hobbits or whatever? Not the hobbits. The the big strong guys that live in the mountains. Oh, the, 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 miners, uh, the uh, I don't oh know what they're gosh. called. I don't listen to Lord of the Rings. <laughs> um, but I know you're talking. You're talking about that guy with a big beard. Yeah, yeah. I can't think of his name, but I know who oh, you're talking about. Goodness. All the nerds are going to get mad. I don't know Sorry, what guys. actor. It doesn't matter. Really. <laughs> I would play myself. Terry. I would, if they were going to make a movie about me, yeah. I would play in that role, man. Like, who well else played. is going to play me? Well played. Well played, sir. Uh, who do I respect as an actor? You know, I like Bradley Cooper as an actor. The last one he did, A Star is Born. I love that movie. Him and Lady Gaga, of all people absolutely killed that movie yeah it's a good movie he would be good i like chris pratt not for his like real movies i just like chris pat pratt for lego movies <laughs> uh, he's good in like jurassic park and those two i don't know i don't know there who you would play me there you go terry all right Sorry. bart Fols. <laughs> does kip have a beard inferiority complex uh apparently yes. not because i shaved and i'm on the on like a video with ryan here in that 
big luscious beard. So it's the dichotomy of facial hair. It's yeah. uh, we do this by design, right? So Balance. we want to we appeal to both the guys who can't or don't want to grow beards and those who feel like they have a moral obligation to rock it for those who can't or don't want to. There you go. So we're taking both, uh, both groups. Yes. All right. Bart had two questions. Number two, if the I'm ideal- really going to have to think, I'm sorry, I got to interrupt you. I'm really going to have to think movie? about that movie thing. Yeah. I wish I had a better answer. I didn't want to dismiss Terry's question. I kind of am intrigued by that question. Maybe you guys have ideas. So if you have an idea of who should play me, hit us up on, you know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, wherever. So who should play you in the story of Ryan's life or do you play them? No, who should play me? (laughs) Sounds good. I'm curious. All right. Bart's second question. If the ideal- He's got to be handsome. He's got to be whoever it is. Got to be a handsome, rugged individual. All right. What is Bart? I'm I'm trying to move on here. (laughs) Uh, if the ideal version of your 80 year old self could, could give you one piece of advice or to your current self, what, what would it be and why? Take more risks. Yeah. Take more risks. Guys, we're, 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 we are playing it way too safe. I mean, we are, as I consider this move across Maine, it's actually a really interesting social experiment to hear how many people are like, Oh, why are you moving? And I say, no logical reason whatsoever. <laughs> Cause I can, I, I don't have a logical reason. I know Pete Roberts with Origin out there and Brian Littlefield and their families. And that's it. Ryan's uh, trying to hook up some free geese from Origin. He thinks that's right. there. he'll get like a discount. We've been out there twice. <laughs> I've been to Maine twice. Hardly enough time to make a reasonable decision to move my family <laughs> across the country. Yeah. Um, I have no logical reason whatsoever. Other than to go back to our previous question is like, I just feel compelled to do it. And like, what's the worst that could happen? We get out there. And, and I, I, we just live these sedentary lifestyles. And I know, I know that every man that's sitting on his deathbed is looking back and he's, he's not saying, I wish I would have taken a, a few less risks. Yeah. I wish I would have played a little safer. I wish I would have been a little mediocre. No, he's saying, man, I should have done that one thing. I should have, I should have asked that woman out or I should have started that business or I should have went on that adventure. Or I should have done this. Should have, should have, should have, should have, should have, should have. Which leads me to believe that most of us regret our lives because we're not willing to take a, a, a calculated risk. Yeah. And what's the worst that's going to happen? You're going to be out a few bucks. You're going to, you're not going to be, you know, happy like we talked about earlier for for a little while. Like, what's the worst that could happen? Play that stuff out and take some more calculated risks. That's that's what I think. Well, without it's, a doubt, you've seen this when with you being in Boy Scouts, right? Like. What happens when you take a risk and you go on a backpacking trip and it goes completely south and everything goes wrong? Yeah, those are the wonderful memories. Right. Like all the mistakes end up being kind of good things, you know, as long as you grow from them. Grow from them. True. Yeah. Yeah. True. All right, Jake. uh, Did we get through the Iron Council questions? (laughs) No. How many more Iron Council questions do we have? Iron Council, guys. Uh, One, two, three, four. Okay, let's get through those quick. We'll do rapid fire on the next four, and then we'll save the Facebook group questions for next week. We'll get to those next week. Yeah, I'll answer them for you. Just do it. Next question. <laughs> yes. Joking. No, yes, no, maybe. I think Stup- so. Stupid question. <laughs> Dumb. Don't. Not answering that. Okay. Okay. Four questions. Let's go. Rapid fire. Okay, Jake Share. How can one persuade an individual that podcasts are not just a boring waste of time? Why would you want to? Why does it matter? <laughs> It doesn't matter what other people want. Like just share what you like. And if they're like, oh, cool, I'll check it out. Then good, good job. If yeah. you're trying to convince them to come to order of man because they really need it. And yet you're having to like push and prod and poke and pull. Look, they're not ready. No big deal. So don't worry about it. Just share what you can and let the chips fall where they may. What else? Lighthouse. Drew sends. what do I outsource first? Delivery of services with my personal clients or off work invoices, newsletters, schedules, et cetera. Office work. Office work. Yeah. Uh, that's, what you, that's what you get rid of first because your interaction with clients is significantly more relevant and uh, more profitable 
than sending invoices and, and inventory and whatever else. So you, yeah. so you outsource the office stuff, keep the personal interaction and delivery to customers. Yeah. You can worry about that later. What else? Yeah. Referrals will come from the clients, exactly. right? not from yeah. the office work. That's Dennis right. Morris, I would love to hear more about your experience with your son's principal in the paper about AR-15s. <laughs> yeah. Curious for how you approach the principal, conversations with your son after, move forward plan. Also, when did, when, when did the, uh, when you did an AR of the whole situation, uh, after action review of the whole situation, what would you do differently next time? Well, I don't really think this is a, a fair representation of what happens in society because I, I, it is what I posted. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, my son yesterday got sent to the principal's office because he wrote a report titled, How to Correctly Shoot an AR-15, <laughs> So, which I was so proud of. I'm like, that's awesome. He read it to me. I'm like, that sounds great, bud. I love it. And then he turned it in and the teacher sent him to the principal's office. Well, the interesting thing about this is, is that the principal and I, we shoot together and we shoot with some young men in our neighborhood through our church program. <laughs> so, so he got sent to the guy that I shoot with occasionally with other young men in the community. Like I wasn't really concerned about it, yeah. but the part that he had to take out. So the principal did ask him to take one part of it out. <laughs> and the, the part that he had to take out was the instructions for how to make tannerite more explosive than it already is. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome. So the principal said, well, you got to take, you got to take this part out, but everything else is good. Another kid got sent to the principal's office about how to shoot a 410, a little shotgun. And the principal said, it's a really good article. Or it's a really good report. Uh, you just need to make sure to add some safety rules in there. So he actually had him add stuff to the report. So the yeah, principal's yeah. great. The, the look, I, I kind of feel like maybe I threw the teacher under the bus a little bit. She's a great teacher. We have a great relationship. I think she was kind of following protocol. You know, she's got to do some things. Yeah. She loves my son. They have a great relationship as teacher and student. Um, and so he tweaked that thing. He took out the instructions for how to make Tannerite more explosive. Got his grade back, did fine on the report, all was well, but that was the situation. Where, where did you learn that Tannerite stuff from? Legacy, baby. <laughs> that was from the Legacy event. We had a couple of Navy SEALs come out, one Navy SEAL and his business partner. So Chad Timney is his business partner and then Fred Ruiz, Navy SEALs. Uh, we blew up some, we, we shot from these guys. They're, they're professional instructors, so they taught us. And then we, uh, how do you say, doctored up the Tannerite to make it a little bit more explosive than it uh, That's funny. That's so funny. if you want to learn how, come to Legacy, orderofman.com slash Legacy. Bring your son. We'll have a good time. And if the, if the Mickler family lived in California, <laughs> this would have been on the nightly news and would yep. have been a national thing. So just And I still would have been proud. I would have been, yeah. oh, I would have been proud. And I would have been doing <laughs> national interviews on CNN and Fox about the how ridiculous it is that a, a child can't talk about something that is uh, constitutionally protected and legal, frankly. So about the AR-15, the assault rifle, that's what it sounds like. Right? Assault, assault rifle. rifle. Yeah. 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 All right. Justin Stewart, surrender. In your opinion, what does it mean to have, uh, what does it mean for a man of action? Okay. Let me read that again. In your opinion, what does it mean for a man of action? For me, it's balancing my plans and action steps with a confidence and sense of peace, knowing that the how is God's domain. In other words, I'm okay either way, but I'm sure going to fight for what I want. God willing, I will get it. I'm, I'm a little lost. I think he's asking for the, your opinion on that word surrender right? Oh, he's not so talking about that? surrender as in quit. He's talking about surrendering Surre to God. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Who sensitive, tough one. Um, I've never been a big, if it's God's will kind of guy, you know, I, I believe that we all have a plan. So I submit myself to that plan, but here's the challenge. I don't know what the plan is. He knows what it is, but I don't. Because I don't know, and this is where we get into the free will discussion. And mm. Sam Harris actually talks a lot about this. He says there is no free will. I think there is because we don't know what's going to happen, which makes us act freely. Now, yeah. if we knew what was going to happen, if we knew the programming, that would influence the results. Just like you're doing a, a, a survey or an experimentation, 
if those that you are just there, there's been surveys and studies about this, those individuals who are studied change their behavior if they know they're studied. Yeah. Which, which takes away some of the free will of it. So I believe that I have a plan for me. I believe that, let me, let me rephrase that. I believe that he has a plan for me and I submit myself to that, but I don't excuse myself of the responsibility and obligation to do any work required to achieve what it is I believe I need to be achieving. And then I ask for guidance and direction along the way. I don't know what the plan is for me. Frankly, I don't even know if I do want to know what the plan is. So long story short, I surrender to him knowing that he has a plan and that when things don't work out, regardless of how hard I tried and everything that I did in order to accomplish what I thought was a worthy objective, I can take it in stride knowing that, you know what? There's a reason for this. Mm. There's a reason that although I put everything I possibly could into making this work, that it didn't work out, that it's all going to be okay. That there's potentially something insulting. That is insulting to our creator who's given us everything that we need to do to create our own lives. I don't know what the plan is. I know there's a plan. I don't know what it is. So I'm going to do everything in my power to live the type of life I feel compelled and called to live. It's a good question to wrap up on. It's a good question. Yeah. It's an interesting thought. You know, I have a lot of guys ask about that. Like, where is the balance? In fact, I made a post about this on Instagram. It's like, where is the balance between being, being sovereign, right? Taking responsibility for yourself and surrendering yourself to a higher power. Yeah. But I don't I think, think those terms are at odds with each other. Yeah, I don't think so either. I mean, I think that's the plan. <laughs> that is the plan Yeah, for you to I mean, be sovereign. Think, look, yeah. l- let's change the relationship. Let's, instead of talking about you and God... Talk about you and your son. Yeah. You want your son to be independent and your daughters. You want your sons and your daughters, biological sons and daughters to be independent. I do. Yeah. I want them to make their own decisions. I want them to have the tools and the experience and the knowledge and the, and, and the know-how to be able to make good decisions. But I, but I also have goals and aspirations and things that I want them to accomplish, but ultimately it's on them. And I'm going to allow them to make the decisions that they feel are in their best interest and be there when they need me to help coax them through a challenging, challenging situation or pat them on the back and say, good job when they make the right decisions. I think if we looked at the relationship between us and our heavenly father, a little closer to the way that we look at our relationship between us and our children, I think we would better be equipped to understand how it all plays out. For sure. Well, and I think if you use your analogy of father and son, I mean, there, there's moments where we may go to our children and say, hey, I know this is tough. I know you don't want to do it. You can do it. Yeah. And this is what you need to do. That's right. the moment of surrender, right? That's when your kid is going, okay, I, I don't see that. I don't see how that's possible. But dad, but okay. I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to trust in you. And you know what? I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. And, and they take action. They take a leap of faith. I think those are the moments of quote unquote surrender. Yeah. Right. Where we have to trust in the Lord that, Hey, you know what? It's going to work out. Yep. <clears throat> um, right on, man. We got through a lot. We didn't get through enough, but we got through yeah. a lot. Yeah. You guys were really excited to hear from Ryan again. Uh, the questions came in flooding. Yeah. Well, and you got through all of the questions last week, which I've never done in my entire life. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. But this is like usually just half the amount of questions that we normally get. <laughs> no, you did great, disclaimer. Um, Let's wrap it up. Yeah. So first off, uh, Ryan talked about this earlier. Um, if you're interested in the Tribe Builder course, uh, there's roughly two to three spots left. That starts, starts February 1st. No future schedules of builder, uh, tribe builders. They may exist. They may not. The point is, take advantage of opportunities that are being placed before you. This is an opportunity. So yep. if you want to learn more, what, what's the URL again, Ryan? Orderofman.com slash tribe builder. I'm not creative. I usually just do orderofman.com slash forward slash. Fill in the blank. Yep. Slash. Not forward slash, guys. <laughs> don't, con- don't get yourself confused. It's just a slash. Just a slash. <laughs> Although there's another button on your keyboard that may confuse you, but we won't talk about that. If you're right. confused, look, if you're confused about what slash to use, do not sign up for Tri Builder. I promise you it will be over your head. <laughs> Good point. Good point. 
Uh, if you want to support this order, um, you know, we talked about this today, right? There, there, there seems to be a heightened um, awareness around masculinity. Um, don't sit back. Don't be a spectator. Uh, join us. Join the movement. Join the order. Uh, there's a handful of ways you can do that. One is to subscribe to this podcast, uh, leave a, a rating and review, share the podcast with like-minded individuals that could benefit. You can join us also on Facebook uh, in the Facebook online group. That's facebook.com slash group slash order of man. And then for you guys uh, willing to step up even more so and get on the court in life, uh, you can do that through joining us on patreon.com slash order of man or join the Brotherhood, the Iron Council, uh, where it is very much about being on the court in life, where we are having discussions in this month in particular around uh, David Goggins' book. Uh, you have that podcast coming uh, tomorrow or what? No, next, next week. week. Tuesday next week. of next week. Tuesday of next week. Uh, and we're, we're taking those challenges for you guys that have, are, are, have not um, read that book. There's challenges in this book. And what's great about it is as I'm reading this book, it's like, hey, here's a challenge and find people to talk to. I'm like, man, we got this already ironed out. Mm -hmm. I already have 15 guys for me to bounce these conversations with. And not only are there just 15 other people, but there are 15 other people that are like-minded, that are on yep. the same page. We're on the same path and we're getting after it. And it's, uh, man, I, I just, I love the momentum we've had in the Iron Council lately. We're growing and great things, great things are coming. I'm, I'm really excited. So learn more about the Iron Council at orderofman.com slash Iron Council. Right on. That's it, oh. guys. And join Mr. Mickler on Insta. Yeah. Instagram, Twitter. I'm doing a lot more on Twitter at Ryan Mickler. So it's at Instagram at Ryan Mickler, Twitter at Ryan Mickler, and then the Facebook stuff is all order of man. Um, and then drop us a note. Tell us who would play me in a movie about my life. I think that's it. Yeah. And just follow Ryan on Twitter because he's twatting all the time. <laughs> Is that, is that, that is not appropriate. That's yeah, not, that is not appropriate. <laughs> what is it right. called? <laughs> tweet. Tweeting. A tweeting? Tweet. <laughs> Come on, man. You got to learn this stuff. All right, guys. We'll let you go. Have a great weekend or a great week. I guess it's only Wednesday. Have a great week and uh, we'll catch you on Friday for our Friday field notes. And of course, next week, David Goggins and AMAs and everything else that we've got going on. So I uh, hope all is well. Glad that you're on this journey with us. Go out there, take action and become the man you are meant to be.